Well, thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity of uh, speaking with uh, people here today. And thank you, everybody, for sticking it out to the last presentation. Um, I asked David earlier to give me a plug at lunchtime. Um, because um, Jay White, who had talked about the Sturgeon River Watershed Report, that was 2012. So what I'm going to provide you with a little bit of today is what's happened since then. So the journey so far. Um, I also love being the last speaker because I got to listen to all the other speakers and I made little notes of my columns and you know, um, uh, I also like to share some of the work that the City of St. Albert's been doing. So in my margin I have little things about, oh that's really interesting, those flow patterns, I want to mention that, that sort of thing. So be patient with me as I, you know, walk through it. Um, I also thought it was kind of fun in terms of uh, talking about the watershed and, you know, growing up in the watershed and being in the watershed. Um, in St. Albert, if uh, right now I have to say to people that I meet, the residents I meet, that I've only lived here for 15 years because a lot of people who live in St. Albert or even within the watershed stay here. And so we have people who've lived here for 40, 50 years, who've grown up here, went to school here, lived on farms. So, you know, I feel, I feel really quite young in terms of uh, being a St. Alberton. Um, but it is the longest place I've ever lived in my life. Um, I also thought it would be kind of a, a fun little fact for you that uh, lets you know that I, I have uh, touched on just about every part of the watershed. So uh, I actually was born in Jasper, Alberta. And uh, I lived at the Columbia Ice Fields uh, as my father ran the tours uh, on the ice fields. So I started right at the start of the headwaters. So um, I've also, you know, I did my university education in Edmonton. When I worked for Alberta Environment, I, I worked out of the Wainwright office, which I'm not sure if it's in the watershed or just outside. It's just outside? Yeah, okay. So uh, I just thought, oh yeah, I've been to both ends. So. So the journey. Um, so I, I started working for the City of St. Albert in 2005. And so I actually celebrated my 10th anniversary on September 1st of this year. Uh, so I've been here for 10 years working for the city. So I'm, that makes me an old timer uh, at the City of St. Albert. So, so I've seen lots of things and lots of things have happened. Um, when I first started here, I was the Office of Environment. I was the one person in the city that took care of any sort of environmental issues. And uh, now our environment group actually includes uh, three, sometimes four staff. Um, Megan Myers is here today. Uh, she joined me in 2006, my partner in crime, uh, when the city council decided that education of our residents was crucial. So my job was to try to keep everybody out of jail. Megan's job was to do all the fun stuff and educate people and, and uh, she's still here, still having fun. And Erin is here because she's gonna be replacing Megan as she goes off to have another child and will probably come uh, fall in love with St. Albert just like I did uh, 10 years ago. So a bit of background. So when I started here in 2005, Obviously there was work going on within the Sturgeon River watershed and, and the city of St. Albert and, and other municipalities. Um, one of the big projects that was going on, which I found very exciting, was a group called the Big Lake Task Force. And they had really, it was a group of seven municipalities that had got together really just to deal with flooding issues around Big Lake. And it actually morphed into something very, very different. Um, for one thing is the seven municipalities, and I believe it was Lac St. Anne, Parkland, Sturgeon, Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, Edmonton, and St. Albert. I believe that that was the group. Um, it started out just trying to address flooding issues, which were starting to occur more and more often because as the area urbanizes, of course, we alter the water patterns. So our stormwater now, instead of having a chance to infiltrate and trickle out slowly, we put these wonderful pipes in that zooms it out to uh, at water body and poof, you have flooding. So um, the group got together to deal with that, but what they ended up doing in the end was realizing that the flooding issue wasn't just about stormwater. It was about the retention of natural areas. It was about having stormwater ponds. It was about protecting riparian areas and wetlands and natural areas. And so they completed a report in 2004, which again, unusually, and which really was a, a big deal, was indicated uh, policies or uh, land use bylaw wording that each of the municipalities should put into their documents. Very much like um, uh, Mayor Cross was talking about this morning. It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another to put it into a law that needs to be followed, making it something that is hard to change. 
So that task force did a wonderful job. We did our task. Um, we dissipated. Um, and, you know, I'm still in touch with some of the people uh, who were on that task force today. Is anybody in the room was on that task force back then? No? Okay. Okay, definitely I'm getting an old timer. Um, there was also a project on the Big Lake Natural Area. I wasn't involved in that project, but it was about the, the incredible diversity and, and wildlife that was around Big Lake. And really what that culminated in was uh, Lois Hole uh, Centennial Provincial Park in 2005. So again, amazing work done by another group. Um, some of you might have seen me speak on in previous forums about um, our first iteration of, of our watershed group that we tried to do called the Sturgeon River Watershed Initiative. Um, I talked about it at the Red, Red Dealer uh, WPAC uh, forum at one point. So obviously the residents in, in St. Albert and the people within the watershed were very interested in watershed management. So um, what we did was, uh, and Andrew is here, he was part of, at the beginning, so we worked with Alberta Environment and a bit with North uh, Saskatchewan Watershed Alliance, but uh, the Land Stewardship Centre took a, a very large role in helping us try to get together this, this broad multi-stakeholder uh, group. So it included everything from municipalities, all the levels of government, First Nations, industry, commercial, right down to farmers and residents. And we started this group and, and um, the goal of course was we were all interested in the protection of the watershed. Well, I got, my, I got some really um, hard lessons in, in working uh, with large diverse groups and collaboration and consensus. And unfortunately the group lasted only for about three years. Um, it was registered as a nonprofit group. Um, we tried to put together some strategies to move forward to get some work done and we weren't able to come to consensus on what we should do. So it was dissolved in 2009 and what I'm going to be talking about here today is kind of since then. So Jay talked about the Sturgeon River Watershed Report. So it was done in 2012. So I was hoping that was going to be a multi-municipal government level kind of a project and it's really supposed to be the foundation for moving forward. But um, because I wasn't able to get everybody to coalesce and uh, you know work together and make shiny bright rainbows etc. Um, I went instead I went to my city council and said look we need to do the study. I wasn't able to get everybody to agree. Can you just give me the money so I can do the study so I can get on with it. And thank goodness uh, and thanks Nolan and I don't remember Malcolm if you were on the council at the time but thank you to the council of today. They gave me the money and uh, I was able to complete the study um, and now this is the story of what's happened since then. One thing I want to mention is uh, the photos that I use in my slideshow. Um, they are all from a local photographer named Dave Conlon. And Dave is an avid naturalist. He takes photos all the time and the most beautiful photos I've seen around Big Lake in St. Albert. And he agreed to let us use these photos not only for our, our watershed report, but any time that I wanted to do a presentation. But I really want to acknowledge him because his photographs are, I mean, they're worth paying for, but he gave them to us so that we could, you know, share the beauty um, of the watershed. I'm going to provide a little bit of a summary because, yeah, you know what? We start out in the morning and it's like, oh, what, what is the watershed? Where is it? So again, remember our watershed, uh, our river is a small groundwater fed prairie river. It's about 3,300 square kilometers, which is really not that big. And it's about 260 kilometers long. And really I think that's largely due to the fact that it goes like this. So um, uh, Candace really covered really well about the land uses and the soils, uh, even just kind of the climate zones. And to, we found out when we did the State of the Watershed report that really, you know, over 70% was uh, disturbed landscapes, largely through for agriculture. Um, half pasture, half crop about there. 20% were natural features like rivers, water bodies, tree stands, uh, you know, any sort of undisturbed features. 5% was water and 4% was uh, developed or urbanized area. Now again, this is my margin note here, so this number is old. So the number that Candace showed today was that at the time it was 4%. It is now at 10%. So, I mean, that's just in a short period of time. Um, so, I mean, this just goes to really um, represent that there is a really fast growth in, in our watershed. And there are impacts that go with that. 
On the agricultural side, I also wanted to mention is that, and I'm not sure if many people know this, but within the Municipal Governance, Governance Act, which is really our big mother document for municipalities, is when you do a municipal development plan, which you have to do, you legally have to do it, one of the, the title or headings that you have to deal with, and there's only like three that you absolutely have to do, you know, planning, transportation, and there's one little hyphen that says you have to deal with agriculture. So I don't know how many people know that, um, but so in every one of our MDPs, we have to have a section on agriculture. Um, and so as much as it's, you know, maybe on the back of our planners' minds, it's right there, it's in the regulations. So I think agriculture is very, very important, and I'm very grateful that uh, we now have the St. Albert uh, agricultural lands, the university lands that are just north of St. Albert. Also wanted just to uh, mention that uh, local food is really big in St. Albert, and um, we have an environmental uh, initiatives grant, and one of the fastest growing grant requests we get are for community gardens. And if uh, this is the second year, if you love this facility, October, the city of St. Albert has a festival called Dig In. And it's all about um, local foods and local um, um, produce and our um, materials. So in, these, uh, in the Dig In, you can actually go to a workshop and learn how to make jam, make sausage, and all these sort of things that we've traditionally lost those abilities to do. So it's really bringing people and teaching them again. And of course the highlight of it is like I think there's a 15 course dinner on Friday night and we have I think it's six chefs come and do all the different areas and they fight to come to our uh, to the event. So it's really quite good. So I mean as I mentioned um, you know 4% now 10% of the land area is is urbanized. And uh, we have some major urban areas, St. Albert, Spruce Grove, Stony Plain are definitely fast growing areas. But we also do contain those, uh, the three counties, two First Nations, four plus towns, and then numerous summer villages. And the key point in this slide is really to think about is, is that that 10% land use has over 75% of our population. And I'd probably say if we updated that, it would probably be closer to the Alberta average of 85. So uh, that is very important because urban impacts on a watershed are very different than agricultural ones. So that area is growing significantly. So we really need as urban areas uh, to be able to manage our impacts. So just to bring it together, and again, I mean, you've heard it here before, um, the Sturgeon River, our watershed, is really a prairie or brown water river. So it is similar to the Battle of the Vermilion. It is not similar to the North Saskatchewan, the Bow, anything that is mountain fed. It is very different. So as much as we have concerns about uh, the rivers in the prairies, and as we heard about the climate changes, it is very common for a prairie river to go totally dry. It is very common for a prairie river to flood its banks like every 15 years. Um, so these things are very common. We have to remember that because the, the rivers are so dependent on snow and rain events. And the, uh, this July was probably the best example of this is because I got, I was on three television channels talking about the low levels of water in the Sturgeon River. And um, at the time when I did the presentation, everybody was like, oh my gosh, you know, is the river dead? You know, is it, you know, what's happening? And I, I, my key message was, look, the water level is very low for a July. This is not the lowest the river has ever been. It probably isn't the lowest the river will ever be. Um, but for July, this was very low. And as you looked at the climate data that was shared this morning, that's exactly what happened. If we look at the water levels now, we're actually above average levels at this point. So you have to remember that with a prairie river. Um, and these dramatic variations, one thing it does for um, other areas across Alberta is Impacts are felt almost instantly in the Sturgeon River because it has such low flows, because it is so dependent on these things. So you really see impacts from nutrients, from pesticides, from sediment very, very quickly. And so when I talk to people at City Edmonton or you know, other areas that have larger rivers, I say, you need to look at what's happening in my area because we're the canary in the coal mine. We are showing impacts that you too will eventually have. Um, it's just it's taking you longer. So those variations and that sensitivity are really hopefully providing information to other watersheds. 
So because of the way that our river is, um, it causes a lot of concerns. So whether that's from levels of government, from our council, from our residents, people are concerned. And I mean, you hear um, similar things, the lake eutrophication, uh, low river levels, uh, fish kills, which we also heard are, are very common. Um, uh, I'm not sure how many people have been out to Big Lake, which is just over here. But the average depth in Big Lake is, is less than two meters. Uh, so it freezes to the bottom almost every year. Um, our river definitely freezes to the bottom every year. Um, so we will definitely get um, fish kills. So we will see dead fish in the spring. We did this spring as well. One of the, the I mean, I guess challenges is, is that what's natural and what's not natural. And uh, that's tough because you need lots of long-term data to be able to figure that out. Uh, St. Albert is very lucky. Um, we do have a, a water flow station that's on our Perron Street Bridge, which is like, it is the uh, oldest bridge structure in Western Canada. Um, and uh, it's been there since 1914. So we have, of course, there's data gaps. And of course, the consistency of the data is probably a bit, but um, uh, it's, it's a great source for me in terms of watching day-to-day -day water flows. After the Big Lake Task Force was in place, one of the recommendations was that we needed more water flow stations. And actually, at the time, we got two more. We have them one on Carrot Creek now, which is a major tributary into Big Lake and is now on St. Albert's border. And I can't remember where the other one is. It's in Parkland County somewhere. <laughs> so my memory's gone. Um, at the same time, um, groundwater. So people talk a lot about groundwater and, oh, we don't have enough information. Well, if you know me for very long, you know I'm all about the data. So uh, we actually have quite a few groundwater wells that we monitor in the city of St. Albert. Not specifically for watershed matters, but related to um, some contaminated sites we have and related to, uh, for example, the Great Nuns White Spruce Forest. I recently put a well in there because they had a concern about the changes in groundwater level as the area develops and how it's going to impact the forest. So right now I probably have about 25 groundwater wells that I test regularly. And um, I can tell you in the last 10 years, five of those in urbanized areas have gone dry. So our groundwater levels are definitely decreasing. In an urban area, that's to be expected. You know, once you cap a surface, it's impermeable. You do not get that infiltration. So for the city of St. Albert, I have a really good idea about the groundwater and the groundwater quality. We're actually adding another 20 groundwater wells uh, this year. And so I have a bit of information in terms of, of, of groundwater levels and the water quality uh, for St. Albert. Again, we've talked about this, so the concerns about the rapid urban development, we have concerns about gravel extraction and stormwater impacts. So again, as I talk about, urban areas are expanding you know, very quickly. Stormwater is one of the biggest point sources of uh, pollution that affect uh, our river or our lakes, water bodies. And um, uh, we're lucky enough in, here at the city that we've been actually doing some monitoring over long term. I'll mention a little bit about that later. I also wanted to uh, just kind of connect to, to Gavin's presentation about the invasive species. Um, again, this is in my margin. And um, the Don't Let It Loose campaign is we are definitely behind this. Um, right now, um, we definitely have flowering rush in our Sturgeon River. And we've been battling purple loose strife uh, for a very long time. And the Himalayan balsam, all very, very pretty plants that likely all came from garden shops. Um, and, uh, but we're fighting them. We've also had the wonderful pleasure of dealing with invasive fish species. Um, uh, it was discovered we had three spines stickleback in one of our stormwater ponds about eight years ago. Um, and the other closest location was Hassey Lake. Um, we don't know how it made it here, probably by somebody introducing it, but uh, they're a major invasive. And so we actually, uh, spent thousands of dollars and eventually had to rotten own uh, the entire pond, which is unfortunate because the pond had actually been built as a constructed wetland and we'd had several years where we were building up the aquatic life within the pond. And so when you, when you put in rotten own, it kills any aquatic life that uses oxygen. So we basically had to kill everything to deal with. It was approximately a population of about 100 uh, stickleback, which are about this big. Um, and wonderfully, 
or not so wonderfully, uh, just in the last month, um, we found out that we have goldfish in uh, one of our stormwater ponds. Um, we've known for a long time, yes, well, we have known that there has been goldfish in one of our, it's called Lacombe Lake. It's actually not a storm pond, it's a self-contained uh, aesthetic feature. So we've known we've had them there for a while, as well as carp and crayfish and a bunch of other stuff. But because it's isolated, you really haven't done much with that. Um, but we recently found out we had goldfish in one of our stormwater ponds, which is more pressing because it does connect to the Sturgeon River. Um, so what's wrong with goldfish, right? Well, they survived the winters, apparently. Uh, the very distressing part of this is that this is a brand new stormwater pond. It was built less than three years ago. And the estimate of the population of the goldfish in this pond is, is in the thousands. So in less than three years, thousands of these uh, goldfish have been able to reproduce. Um, we've put together a program um, where we're going to try to draw down the water and try to uh, eradicate them through netting and electrofishing um, this fall. And that in itself is going to be between twenty-five and $35,000. And it is likely that we'll have to do this at least three or four times before we'll be able to uh, get rid of the goldfish. So it is not an inexpensive endeavor. So um, we are definitely a participant in the Don't Let It Loose campaign.